yeah, I just love diving and everything that comes along with it. And anybody in the UH system can sign up for it, and you know, as long as you have uh, your open water through Patty or Naui, whoever, um, yeah, you can do that. And then I got all my certs through the school. And yeah, everything that I learned is used in NOAA, used throughout DONR, and a bunch of state agencies and everything. So it's very, very useful for job opportunities also. So go for it. And you know Jeff Kuwabara. And I know Jeff Kuwabara. I know that guy too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess many, most people who've been through Quest know Jeff Kuwabara. <laughs> yeah, he's been, uh, he's been there a while. Do you want to share your adventures as a scientific diver as well, Hans? I think you mentioned before you had been a scientific diver, right? Yeah, for a while. Uh, I, th I think I started at UC Berkeley. Mm. The nice thing about Berkeley is they they had a wonderful diving safety officer, Lloyd Austin, and he was one of those you know first line diving safety officers from the from the sixties. They had a wonderful program back in the day. They dove in Northern California. And they dove in, you know, cold water, surf zones, rocky beaches. We definitely had an attitude. <laughs> we thought if we were, if you're a North Coast <laughs> California diver, you, you pretty much had a swagger every time you walked into a dive shop. <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of places like that in the world. Of course there are. And um, <coughs> what were you using your um, scientific diving certification for? Was it for uh, marine archaeology projects? I wasn't doing marine archaeology then. I didn't know about it. So I was assisting biologists because I was a geographer oh, cool. as an undergraduate. Yeah. I remember we, we rode herd on a wild uh, group of abalone, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we, we tagged abalone, chased them down, hunted them down, <laughs> tagged them. Fast little buggers. <laughs> I'm kidding. They're pretty slow. Yes. Um, if anyone mm -hmm. uh, doesn't know what an abalone is, um, they have shells, and they <laughs> they're not uh, they do not have fins. They're a big mollusk. Yeah. One big foot. Yeah. They're delicious. They're actually really cute too. Yeah, very yeah. cute. Yeah. And I think we're looking at, uh, we are looking at a very beautiful bamboo coral rip, probably a lepidisis, and as uh, an Asako very nicely has uh, directed us towards an ID for the little red pink thing we saw on the sponge. So uh, it is a benthictinophore. Uh, again, very difficult to pronounce. <laughs> Taylor and help me out. The family uh, is. Jalfelidae, the genus Jalfiella, or Talfiella. That's about as good as I think I could do. I'm not sure how to pronounce the T it's and a J. Big, yes, it's right. either mm -hmm. it has a T and a J in the start, so we are confused how to pronounce it. But it's a benthic dinophore. Thank you so much, Asako. And it's a very beautiful organism that we saw in the picture on the benthic animal guide. is also very detailed. I never would have guessed that was a tina form. Yeah. Mm. And we're now looking at a faded sea sponge. There was, uh, I didn't see any streamers. Maybe there was, because the image. They're hard to see. <laughs> yeah, they're very hard to see sometimes. I'll show you the image of the benthic animal then. As I go, so she says that she can't pronounce it as well. A Voltaire sponge. And 
we had a viewer <coughs> asking if you had any um, ideas. Oh, we're going to do a quick zoom first, though. <laughs> yeah, so it is another one of the Baltasenia sea pens, and are we in a position to collect? Yeah. Ooh. Can we stop? Yeah, then that would be great. And there's a sign of uh, sea cucumber. Because there is some confusion with the phylogenetic position of this coral. Good. And yeah. it's very difficult to ID them to the genus. And we've seen a number of these, yeah. and it's an underrepresented species, so it's important <laughs> to understand. Have you kept a tally of how many you've seen? Yeah, I think this is probably the third or the fourth. Okay, uh, in that case, we should only take a snip. Yeah, it's a snip. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, obviously cool. not the whole. Awesome. We don't need the. <laughs> And the thing is that there Good are point. several uh, halipters or baltasina in the, say for example, uh, in the museum collection, Smithsonian. And I have subsamples of those, but the problem is that they are all quite old samples and they were preserved. They weren't preserved in Can the you, uh, in there, best forward. way for genetics, so they don't work. It comes to genetic engineering. Uh, no, I think we'll put it in the box. It's good, thanks. Thank you. It would likely get stuck in the tube. I don't know. It could. What do you think, Taylor? Just stick it in the box? Depends on how much you want. You're Sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Uh, how much How much are we getting here? Uh, at least 10 okay. centimeters. Go ahead. Go away. Um, yeah. 10 centimeters should be good. Got it. So that might get stuck in the tube? Uh, 10 centimeters should go. Oh, okay. Uh, it's up to you guys. Okay. Taylor, Ann, it's up to you. Zoom back come? in, please. Uh, up sorry, down. I was conferring with science to make sure. Um, Either way is fine. So whatever is this easiest sampling method, um, there's no preference. Well, it's easy to just stick it in the box. All right. Sounds good. That look like 10 centimeters. A little more, a little less. I think that's yeah, 10 that centimeters. Fine. There. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Hmm. Sure, what's happening there? And you can go ahead and put that um, with the rock sample that we collected to conserve space. So that was in starboard box E. Right. You can zoom in there if you want. Or I put this in the box. Remember that Atalanta view right there. Wow, yeah. I always love watching at the Atlanta view during collections. And what was the, the name of this one? I'm not sure how to Baldi spell it. B-A-L. Okay, I'm going to float up now and just go dead stick. Yep. Well, let go in here. Go away from me. Close the box a little bit. Keep going, keep going. Okay. Oh, I gotta come up. A bit. Thank you so much for the direction. Oh, it's a floater. It's floating. Okay, close the box. Close the box. Close the box.
If it's floaty, we can slurp. Yeah, I think we'll slurp. Awesome. You have to make sure we have no our tether is good or quick. I'll add a note that sea pens are floaty sometimes <laughs> for the future. All right. I'll come back down. We're good on tether. Stretch it out here. I yep. drifted way off to the south there. Yeah. So you can uh, turn left and look at the tether for me. Yep. Looks all right. I put the cursor around where we stopped. Okay, I'm gonna um. Yeah, you can. Fifty percent to kind of flush it. Yep. Go ahead. Flush complete. Roger. And then a sample jar one is good. Works for me. Yep. Oh. No slurps have been used yet. All right, sample jar one, ready to go. Uh, can you porch out a bit? Porching out. Okay, Jana, zoom in for us there, please. All right, you can turn it on. 50%. Right. Going 75. Yeah, right there. Come on. Yeah. There, we there go. There we go. Okay, you're winning. That was sample number oh. zero seven zero. In sample Perfect. jar one. Thank you. They had the same thing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice. Mm -hmm. And again, <coughs> acknowledging the special place that we're Portrait. in, Papahanaumokuakea, and every sample that we take is a gift, and just acknowledging that even the rocks and everything in this place. Um, are sacred and we are taking an ancestor from its home and we are grateful for that so thank you thanks for that reminder Elsie nice nice knit then the way we go Okay, and just on a note, um, Kara had to leave us early to do a ship to shore, so uh, we will finish off the watch without her, but we're really grateful to have her um, guiding us and keeping our audience engaged. Right. And I'll do my best to finish <laughs> off the watch. Um, a I poor am. imitation, for uh, sure. You do very well. <laughs> no, you are. Yeah. This is a wonderful watch team. Exactly. Black coral there. Yes, and another beautiful bati batis, which can sometimes look like sea fans from a distance, but yes, a bati bati is probably the same genus bati bati as you'd all turn at all. We're good? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yep, good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think black corals might be my favorite. Yeah. Um, I, I do really like their Ritigorgia, though. I like rocks. <laughs> <laughs> the rocks are pretty cool too. So many different kinds and shapes. Geology yeah. is cool, but biology is beautiful. Oh, I love that statement. <laughs> that should go on a t-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> you should sell that. I tried to talk to Hannah for a while in preparation for, you know, as we go over this, since we don't have a geologist on our team and I already forgot everything she told me. <laughs> Um, I think I was... Uh, one more quick zoom there for us. What I got, the short amount that I got from listening to Val when she started her watch on at the beginning of this dive, um, all the information I retained is just that um, the seamount is conical in nature, so unlike some of the other ones we've been seeing, which were guillots with okay. a flat top, um, this is more of a classic, you know, like volcano shape. 
and that's the end of what I retain from what she said. Yeah. Um, I know we talked about like there's the pillow lava, and I think we passed that coming up here, but I don't think that's what this is. And I think she described this, but I don't remember. This is so. rubble. Did you say rubble? Some rubble. She said there'd be some lobate flows as well, maybe sheet flows, but uh, that a lot of it is, is welded down by the crust, magnesium crust, manganese crust. Yeah, I think we've seen both of those. Uh, the lobate flows are more rounded looking and then the sheet flows are flat and like sheets. So I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think together collectively we are doing well. We're not being <laughs> yeah. challenges. We are somehow <laughs> managing, or we think that we are managing, unless the <laughs> actual geologist comes we're, and tells us we're making ourselves up. Ourselves yeah. we're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, all the geologists watching at home are just shaking their heads. Exactly. Uh, yeah, we are passing some beautiful uh, bamboo coral whips. So Jake, that first science diving course I was involved with, that was a long time ago. We had horseshoe collars. Oh my gosh. Oh. For BCs. Horseshoe collars? Was terrible. It's an old style that people don't use anymore. Yeah. Dang. Similar in shape to our work vest, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, we call those horse, horseshoe collars. Oh. Horse collar BCs. Sorry, horse collar, yeah. They're, they're horse collar they're BCs. Actu they're actually type 5 like this. So they're like I part of the diving that. suit? I never heard that before. I just heard horse collar. Yeah, they're separate. Do a uh, quick zoom on the possible magazine nodules there. Yeah. North Carolina, North California. There were some Voltaria sponges. Uh, looking rockish, but yeah. Good to note. No nodules. They yeah. don't have that Who appearance, knows? like like overbaked brownies, like overbaked cupcakes. Yeah, no, they kind of look botryoidal, also another term that we were, we learned. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Like that one is with like the, yes. Yeah. We have 50 meters left in this movement. Right. Hopefully that I guess close to the end of the watch. You know, listening to everybody talk about their diving experiences, like I've never had a chance to, I've snorkeled but never dived and I've never got my diving certification done, but that was so, that is something that has been on my list for years and years. But it's always like expensive and something or the other that I've never gotten right. around to right. doing it. I really want to eventually. Well, I, I used to teach sport diving, you know, so it's it's fun. Sport scuba yeah, diving? Or Recreation diving. Maui instructor. Wow. Recreational. Not another underwater instructor, Maui, <laughs> right? Oh, that's what the acronym stands for? Not really. No. <laughs> no, no please, please, Maui people, don't, uh, don't, don't yeah. take offense. Now the Maui instructors are all shaking their heads, too. Maui's, like, yeah, pretty uh, non-profit. I did mine yeah. through Maui. Uh, this is, uh, looks like a dead sponge. Dead, dead glass sponge. Uh, and yeah, yeah, probably a dead euplectelid. It's just interesting. A dead Voltaria no, probably. Yeah. And, or maybe those are hydro, hydroids growing on the dead sponge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's good to see, look at the structure of the uh, sponges that for the live sponges that we see. And we can we can continue yeah, moving. Yeah, thank you. And the other was uh, Batibathys yeah. again. Cup coral. Uh, oh, yeah, there was a cup coral, right? There was a cup coral. Uh, Push in a bit more, please. That's good, thanks. And on the rock on the left, we have a batipathies and again, an, uh, mm. parantipathies. Okay. Yeah. And there's something white, probably a chitin here. And one more quick zoom there. Looks uh, like a guy to lose right? visibility here. Or yeah. not a not an old hold fast or a stipe or Looks a like it. Hmm. Uh, hold that. Not seen closely. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, it's a Yay, little Yay, a fast one for this dive. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, go away. What <laughs> is that? Chitin, a uh, mollusk. Oh, okay. 
they're much the shallow water species are a little bit bigger right? yeah anyway upashan i would like to invite you to come to palau and get yes. dive certified oh i would love to visit i was just talking to kara earlier today that i'm going to make a trip to her place and then palau yeah i also want to visit both of you everyone yeah. is all invited of, of you, we should then we will all together. go diving yeah i just caution that everything will pale in comparison to yeah. that if i do say so myself oh i'm sure <laughs> um but yeah everywhere has um unique things and i would love to go diving in california and hawaii just to see um how different, probably, how different it yeah. is yeah well, california's well, you're welcome. cold water yeah. you're welcome to come visit oh, la I've, oh i don't know about the <laughs> so cold water a though different <laughs> style of diving do you dive in a dry suit hopefully <laughs> uh, if you, yeah, if you're lucky. I have a yeah. seven mil suit and it's still not in a hood. Yeah, it's oh, yeah diving is so different. I've never scuba dove in uh, warm water. I've only ever right. scuba, yeah, like quarries water. and the cold ocean. Yeah, <laughs> even in dry suits, we'd, we wouldn't last that long up in Alaska. We'd be good for 45 minutes. Oh my goodness. Wow. It's time so to get out. I probably would have a lot to learn um, just because in warm water diving, we don't worry so much about what we're wearing because yeah. the temperatures. Okay, it has been good. described as bath water, but <laughs> <you> <laughs> that's know. good. Another guy did. Yeah. Yeah, and I and Carrie was earlier showing me pictures of manta rays that she dug around Palau, and I would love to see manta rays. I love them. Come big island. I oh, was I went on good. a manta ray dive and yeah, uh, but I did my it was my uh, advanced n nighttime navigation. Yeah. So I used up all my air, and uh, when I went to the surface, then everyone else who was like weighted down just to see the mantas, yeah. they s then the mantas appeared, so I missed it, and I was oh. really upset. Those are another sign of lactic sickness. Next time, Mia. Yeah, yeah, next time. But I have to first get my diving certification. Yeah. Oh. You know, I enjoyed teaching the recreational diving, but uh, it's hard to make a living. You know, it's very competitive, so you're, you don't get paid very much as an instructor. Please. Interesting. I did not know that. 20 meters mm -hmm. left. I think this would be another store of patties or those branched um, parentipatties, because we have those branched parentipatties. I need to sit with a black coral expert and get these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say branched parentipatties, not a store of patties. Is this similar to the one we collected on the uh, other dive? No. Okay. I was, I, from a distance I said that it's a Storopathis, then it would have been a similar okay. one. But this is a Parantipathis, so okay. it kind of has the Bathipathis structure, but with branches at the end. Yeah, like when I was back in India, and undergrads, masters, scuba diving was so expensive. Like I was like, oh, I'll do it later. Uh, then, like in yep. grad school, also obviously as a grad it's student, I can't really yeah, afford it. It's it very hard to break into. Yeah. I personally had to take out student loans in order to, and exactly. I also took the course with my university. So That's good. the class I didn't actually pay for, but all the equipment I had to I still, had to, yeah. yeah. And then to do scientific diving, yeah, it's Once even again. more. So expensive. Yeah. You have to pay to play. Absolutely. Bless yeah. the house. I'm sure there are scholarships out there. I don't know of any on top of my head, but. Um, definitely needs to be more support for Absolutely. people to get yeah. break into that field. Yeah. It's very, very hard to get into. Being in Louisiana, it also meant that I had to travel somewhere for the certification. That's like added cost yeah. on my staying and time, but expenses also overall. Yeah, I got trained in a quarry because I went to um, college in Indiana, which is a land locked state. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> did you say a quarry? A quarry, yeah. I also did. So freshwater, it was all just, like, they had sunken plains and things down there, though, so it was really cool. Oh. It was freshwater? Mm -hmm. I got, yeah. Uh, I, I also got did. Very murky. Mine in a quarry in Ohio. What? Yeah. Well, would yeah, a lot of people training quarries. The buoyancy would be different, though, no? A little bit for freshwater. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot easier for me to, to swim around in uh, yeah. salt water. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Harder in fresh water then. Yeah, you're a lot heavier. Yeah. So our, our sanctuary's office with NOAA has a partnership and memorandum of agreement. We collaborate with the National Association of Black Scuba Divers and I've done a number of projects with them and their program, once they were trained up, became Diving with a Purpose, DWP. 
I've now they, heard of them, Now they yeah. train their own underwater divers to do science and archaeology underwater. It's a wonderful program. That's awesome. Yeah, I've yeah. heard a lot about that program, but never, um, I guess I've met Justin Donovan, but that haven't, yeah, gotten into that program, but it would be really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I did a ship to shore with a group of kids in Palau, and they're actually in a dive camp, which is a really cool program where um, they basically get enough funds for like a group of kids, like four or five kids to get dive certified. So they go through, they're like high school um, and college kids and they go through the whole program and at the end they're open water divers. So it's pretty cool. Well, that's it's cool. awesome. I wish I yeah. had something like that. I think we are coming up on some, uh, some corals that uh, right. you're seeing for the first time on this dive. Let's zoom in. Looks like a hemichorallium from a distance, two hemichoralliums from a distance. And uh, one of those trichosoma, I'm, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, those sea urchins, and we had passed one of those okay. a little while. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, hemichorallium with ophiroids. That's great. This would be the first observation on this dive, even though we have seen several of them in, on the previous dives. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we've cycled through the ship, remember, by the way. All right. You know the difference between a diving instructor and a large pizza? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, Don. No. I would not have imagined that there's any difference. Well, a large pizza feeds a family of four. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Now the dive instructors are shaking their heads at us. I'm sorry about they that They're not joke. shaking their heads. They're hitting their heads against walls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Total to four watch is coming for you, everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. another uh, heavy core. I know. Thank you. So is it, is this the same in the colony, or we're looking at a different, different one? I mean, Asako is probably suggesting a different ID. Let me check with her. But yeah, we can continue moving. Right there. Okay, I can go away. Is that a tiny cup coral in there? I do see that. It looks like it. Anyway, just to finish off the science diving thing, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I became a a commercial diver for a while, a little bit, a very tiny while, in the Gulf of Mexico. Then I was in the diving safety office at East Carolina University, their science diving program. And then I ended up being a UH right. science diver, like Jake. Mm -hmm. and oh, it, that's interesting. And I became a NAWI science, I mean a NOAA science diver and a NOAA diving supervisor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to take Jason Leonard's job. It's my dream. <laughs> He's very good at his job. Is that a diving, su the current diving supervisor? He's one of the diving supervisors. Oh. He's the diving supervisor for the monument. Oh, wow. Thank you, Hans, for that. You're um, welcome. Just letting us know about your journey as a diver and also a cautionary tale, I guess, right. <laughs> if you in about 52 oh. years of diving. <laughs> but you know, um, I'm sure there's people out there who are passionate about it, and uh, if it's something that they would like to pursue, then I'm sure there's a way that they could make it work. Um, and yeah, like we've said, there's programs out there. Hopefully, if um, any of our listeners are interested and they're not certified right now, um, Hopefully there's a way to get out there and explore the ocean with your own eyes. It's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, One is. step yeah. at a time. One step at a time. And in the meantime, you can be right here with us yeah. on Nautilus Live, exploring the deep, deep depths where no scuba diver could ever go, I think, yet. <laughs> Maybe true. in 100 years when there's the technology. Um, nope. Nope. <laughs> no. No. These depths? No. The, the human body couldn't handle it. Yeah. I don't think and we so. shouldn't do If Randy Kosaki told me he'd been down to these depths, I'd believe him. <laughs> Is that a free diver? No, he's a... <laughs> uh, uh, he works for Noah. He's a big diver. Oh, okay. He's, he's a legend. 
Smugglers, uh, see an enemy? Push in there. Does it look like a mushroom for right? Yeah. Is it a mushroom? There is a mushroom coral. And a cup coral. Cup coral. Do the cup corals get much bigger than that? Or it can it's be slightly bigger. A little bit, uh, big, but not too much bigger. No. That's good. Thank you. Coming out. Yeah, we made good progress on this watch. Oh, we absolutely. Gone from close to waypoint one to oh, almost we'll to waypoint three. Right this is a new record, Mia. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm sure to get paid <laughs> <laughs> at least uh, one large pizza. <laughs> and also, you saw two sea stars. Yeah. Maybe some yeah. garlic bread with it. We saw a lot of cool stuff on this watch. <laughs> Even though, yeah, yeah, it seemed pretty barren, but we saw that um, diversity the, was high. Yeah, 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 the the whale uh, whale fossil, fossil was yeah. amazing. That the, the Benthictino four was that the frogfish? No, no, no. The frogfish was a Chonacosidae. Ch John, yeah, Chonacidae. Chonacidae. Yeah. Those uh, purple sea urchins that moved purple around. Purple sea mm -hmm. urchins, mm -hmm. the pseudomulus, the. Uh, Guidance, I love the guidance. Mm -hmm. Saw a few of the acorn worms. Yes, I think they're called. the acorn yeah. worms. Yes, yes, absolutely. They were. I I haven't seen them in a long time, so that was. And the little mollusk, the mm -hmm. white thing. I don't know the scientific names. <laughs> <laughs> Just like. <laughs> okay, we have. Just a few yeah. minutes left on our watch, um, so we'll continue. But if there is some lag in the feed, it's because we have people changing over for the four to eight watch, the early morning watch. With this has been the twelve to four watch, or dead man's watch. Mm -hmm. We sometimes say <laughs> we are the dead man. Yeah, traditionally, the middle watch. <laughs> the middle yes. watch, yes. Followed by the morning watch. The morning watch. <laughs> the sunrise watch. Yeah. And we also saw some sea cucumbers. Uh, oh yes, we saw quite a few on quite the a few. sediment, um, yeah. which seems to be a better habitat. All right, everyone, Derek's gonna relieve me. Great watch, great job, Jake. Thanks, Mia. Thank you, watch. Thank you, front row. Good job getting those waypoints. <laughs> it's all you. <laughs> In spite of us. <laughs> Zoom in on the Come in. little orange thing on there for us. Zoom in on the little orange thing. And Those holding. would be like uh, ring and enemies that are many a times found associated with the bamboo corals. Oh. There we go. Let me see if I can get better focus on this. Oh, it's really close. Who knew? Two of them. All good. Uh, uh, that's a yes. Dan's signing enough. Dan's out of here. Thanks, Dan. A little push. And back over there.
Check, check. Set one, set two, set three, recorder one, recorder two, recorder three, recorder four. Let's see if those are still alive. Yes. Oh, that's good. Good morning, everyone. Can y'all hear me okay? Just fine, Miss Tori. Yay. Thank you, Ed. Looks like there were a lot of interesting things on the last watch. Yeah, frogfish. Uh, what type of fish? Frog. Oh, I thought that, or they also saw an acorn worm, which I really like. Uh, first time I saw those was off, uh, off Southern California. Super cool, they're like purple heads and you can see the sediment going through them. I'm about to look up a picture. I don't know why they're called acorn worms though, because acorns aren't purple. Oh. The jellyfish that, or the jelly that we saw at the end of our last watch, that kind of oh, had yeah. an acorn shape. Yeah, that one, <laughs> that one I could have seen call, or understood calling an acorn jelly, but no, that's not this. It's not, it's the ones at the top, I scroll up. On like the right, the purple one there, yeah, that's it. They're very strange looking. But they're kind of like, um, uh, it's like sea cucumbers that like ingest sediment and then clean it and comes out the other end. Mm -hmm. Oh, that looks like an upside down ice cream cone. Splat.
So last group, last watch um, was getting moved around by some currents. So they decided to, to skip waypoint two. They just kind of went up to the side of it. Um, but we're almost at waypoint three. Um, how many waypoints do we have anyway? Eight. Eight. All right. That's cool. Let's see. I see now. What's that? I see now. It's right in front of yeah, my face. It's right in front of you. Do us, Roger. Yep, ready. I think now we've got everyone in here kind of settled in on our four to eight watch. Yeah, this is a yeah. bridge nap. A little bit of a journey for the four to eight watch. Can we please track a line bearing <laughs> 270 at 0 0.2 knots? Thank you. Okay, for our introductions this morning, um, I was thinking that, you know, we tell a little bit about ourselves, where we're from, what our role is, and then share maybe one way that you're like trying to take care of yourself because this is week three and I feel like it's definitely, um, I don't know, I'm feeling like extra tired. I feel it hard. So, good morning, my name is Tori Hunt. I am sailing as a science communication fellow and when I'm not sailing, I'm a high school science teacher in North Carolina. Um, and this is my very first time sailing. I'm having so much fun, learning so much, and I'm gonna hop off soon for my first ship to shore interaction of the morning. Super excited. And I feel like I've gotten a lot better about any time I have a chance to go take a nap, I just go take it. Even if I don't feel tired in that moment, I know I will feel grateful that I made that decision later. So that's one way I've been trying to take care of myself. Malia, what about you? I think you might be muted. Or, Oh, it looks like you're plugged into the bottom one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know she had two over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I can hear you. Okay. There you go. There we are. It is very early in the morning. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm Malia Evans. Um, I am um, on board as a resource monitor for Papahana Mokoakea and also an educator um, when I'm not sailing, which is most of the time. I work as an outreach and education coordinator for Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. And the ways I've been taking care of myself is um, using the gym. So I usually go every night down to the gym and do my workouts. Um, that's been really good because it makes me so tired <laughs> that I just crash out because I go late at night. Yeah. And so after I'm done, I, I crash. What do you do so in the gym? I usually do Pilates, yoga, stretching, that kind of stuff that I usually do at home. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Nice. Mike, what about you? Yeah, I'm Mike Brennan, uh, maritime archaeologist with Search Inc. and the uh, co-lead scientist on this expedition um, and watch leader on this watch. I, uh, yeah, I agree with you on the nap thing. Um, I used, when I, so I used to uh, come out on Nautilus a lot more um, as a, a grad student and then uh, for a Dr. Ballard, but then, uh, and I would always like feel bad sleeping. Like, I'm like, oh, there's probably something to do. I shouldn't go to sleep. And it's like, I'm over that now. <laughs> it's like, no, no. <laughs> uh, because, you know, we do a lot. We're up at strange hours and, uh, you know, there's never, you never have an eight hour period to sleep because you're um we're off watch for eight hours but you're you have to get up a little early to get up here you have to shower and brush your teeth and do whatever to get ready for bed when you get off watch so it's like um i don't know i don't know where that came from but i certainly have gotten over that and uh yeah also plenty of coffee stay and also keep hydrated people uh I found myself not drinking as much water as usual just because, you know, 
running around a lot. So all of those things. Hannah? Hi, I'm Hannah Parody. I'm part of the science team as a geologist. I am a grad student at California State University, Long Beach. And this is my first time sailing with the Nautilus. And what I do to like stay rested, I usually split up my sleep into like four hours and four hours. So four hours before the shift and four hours after. So I'll eat breakfast and then I'll be full and ready for ready for my nap number two. And then um, usually, cause it takes me a bit to wake up. So I'll probably like, I go and read just to s start waking myself up. But yeah, that's that's what I do to like treat myself. Uh, Sebastian. Hi everyone, I'm Sebastian Martinez. I'm an undergraduate research at, researcher at University of Hawaii at Manoa. This is my second time aboard the Nautilus. Um, for me to kind of keep functioning here on the ship, um, I try to um, usually get up about an hour earlier um, and uh, try to stay up for most of the day, but usually somewhere in the middle, I end up taking about a 30 to an hour long nap. Nice, thank y'all for sharing. Anyone on front row ready for an introduction? Yeah, I can go. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Derek Sowers. Um, I work for the Ocean Exploration Trust as our mapping operations manager, so working with the map and nav department for navigation. Um, and uh, let's see, to take care of myself, I usually prioritize trying to get exercise every day. It just makes me feel, feel better, and that's kind of what I do at home. So just trying to keep up a routine that you're happy with. Um, and then, yeah, trying to t stay in touch with some family members, trying to call different people, um, you know, every other day just to see how people are doing back on shore is nice, make you feel more connected. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Yep. I'll go. My name is Jake Bonney. I'm in the Hercules chair, and I like to, uh, I guess, same, same as a couple other people. I like to work out, but I like to do it on a nice day up on the monkey deck. Um, bring up, bring up my yoga mat up there. Do some stretching and some, uh, some other workouts. It's nice in the sun um, and nice to be outside. That's nice. I love it up there. I need to spend more time up on the monkey deck. It is truly one of my favorite places on the ship. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Jake. What about you, Tito? Oh, get it. Uh, SPL. SPO. Down. Down, too. Down. Hey, good morning. Tito Calacious in the Atalanta pilot seat. Uh, let's see. I stay away from the junk food bin to take care of myself. <laughs> That's good, huh? I'll do the opposite. <laughs> Dive in face I didn't first. I say I was yeah. always successful. But right. I yeah. try to stay away from the junk food bin. This is Ed at video. Uh, I've got my sleep schedule down, so I, uh, my phone actually has alarms. Depending on what watch I'm standing, I just toggle them on or off, and that works out pretty well. But I, uh, I have a self-care period. I do it when I wake up in the afternoon, which is at 2.45 p.m. local. And that's my hygiene break and meds and all that other stuff. And that's, uh, that helps keep me on track. And then uh, I always take some time, no matter how short, to uh, do a little reading. Uh, I never feel guilty about taking a break. It's uh, absolutely necessary. So uh, that's, that's my trick. And then my other tip on self-care is I'm not coming out for 90 days in a row anymore. I'm doing about a month on, month off. Yeah, that's probably healthy. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone in here sailing again this expedition season? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Nope. <laughs> that's that's a no for me. <laughs> I'm going home for October, but I'll be here in November and December. 
Yeah, so th that's that's late. Um, the expeditions go what till like mid December? Twenty fifth or no twentieth? Yeah, really? Right, right before wow. Christmas. Jeez. Yeah. That's very late. I've that's got cool. a trip right before Thanksgiving. Uh, I'll be out here for Thanksgiving. Uh, both American and Canadian Thanksgivings. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think I'm out here the fifth. Jake, what about you? Are you coming back out? Yeah, I'll be out. Um, I'm on the next leg, so. Oh, so you're staying. I have out. another four or five weeks left. Of the, oh of the boy. Yep. Yeah, and we have cruise legs are just longer now because we have so much more area to travel in the Pacific than Gulf of Mexico or Caribbean or Mediterranean. Um, so you you know coming out you you can't really come out for a week anymore. We used, uh, to, we used to have people out for as short as like three or four days. Yep. And our expeditions are almost entirely at least three weeks, if not four. Yeah, they have to be. The last couple of years. Just they have to be just because the transit going so far. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not economical. I mean, we, even even on the west coast, they could do like a week or something, but um, and have people come in and out. But yeah, and you know that's more efficient, really. Um, I'd I'd rather be out here for four weeks than like four different trips of one week because it's less travel, it's less transit, it's you get into routine better. In the uh, height of the pandemic, uh, because of our COVID protocol that included a two week mandatory uh, hotel quarantine before boarding. Oh, wow, okay, yeah. We, I covered the entire season for the video engineering position with, I think, five people. Wow. Uh, just to reduce how often we were incurring that cost. Yeah. All right, y'all, I'm about to hop off for a ship to shore. I'll be back. All right, have fun. Have so much fun. Well, that's the edge of a lava flow, huh? Yeah, looks like that. That's cool. Mm -hmm. So, Derek, are we, let's see, what are we doing? We're just we're we're close to waypoint three right yeah, now. Yeah, I don't need we don't need to go directly to it. I don't think so either. Um, where's four? Just up to the left. Yes. Yeah, kind of up to the northwest. So I think what I was planning to do is kind of come in yeah. another somewhere in here, which is like two hundred and eighty-five meters from where we are now. Yeah. And then head pretty directly up these contours to waypoint four. Yeah, I mean, you can do that. I think you can also just, if you want to just start moving to waypoint four from where we are now, either way is fine. These these were just kind of picked arbitrarily, uh, e even more arbitrary than usual. Just kind of like, um, you know, and they even said, like, if you aren't, aren't following the waypoints, that's okay, just the general trajectory. Right. So whichever you want to do. The last okay. Rock. The last rock what, all, what do the null points 69. mean? What do you mean? What, uh, uh, there's point? two points to say null. What's that mean? I would say we're going to probably I have no idea. That was the last watch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's not... <laughs> I, I just... I don't know why. That That's is not it. my nomenclature. I don't know why there would be points <laughs> labeled that. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. Maybe it was like, don't go that way. Um, try to not head that direction. So shoot, shooting through those two points is my guess. Oh, uh, maybe. Um, also, we're probably going to soon get to rock o'clock time. Oh. The last time they picked it was literally at, at the beginning. No, uh, Han said that they took a rock. Oh. Where? I don't know. Maybe it's one of the null oh. points. Oh, See, at the beginning, right there's there? There's two samples <laughs> on this track. Well, Three samples. We have a uh, um, C pen, a sediment core, surprisingly, and a rock from the very beginning of the dive. Oh. Okay, well, it was it was Hans's watch, but I guess maybe they didn't get they probably didn't get down very far by the time uh, Val's watch ended. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, w whenever you want. Would yeah. you like one in this region we're heading to, to the west here a little bit? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, that that determines our uh, where we're going then. <laughs> well, yeah, cause we, that's kind of like a little saddle. Well, not a yeah. saddle, but a little flat spot. We can do that there. I mean, it, it'll likely look 
pretty similar to this, but it might be a little bit less yeah. steep. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I am not picking rock samples anymore because oh, I don't want to no. get dis I don't want to get disappointed. No. I, I don't want to be let down. So it's all Hannah now. No, no, <laughs> no, no. How did the rock cutting go yesterday, by the way? It went really well. So we we had a feeling that they would be really good rocks, and they were. I actually was able to um, see some amphibles, which is what I used for my rocks, which are like, you can kind of tell the difference in their crystal because they're like pancake shape. They're like elongated, and they're usually oriented um, horizontally. And also, we saw a lot of clinopyroxenes, which is another really useful mineral for doing age, for doing age determinations. So it was really good, and we were able to look at some of them under the microscope, and we saw plagioclase crystals, which I'm assuming are around the 212 micron size, but I'm not sure. But if I was guessing, it would be probably around the smaller end of the sizes. That would also be useful in collecting data and, and ages. So really exciting about all the rocks that we got because they're, they are all fantastic. And we still have to open a few more from the last dive, but again, those also look just as promising as the ones that we just did. So... Can you explain to the layperson, like, why, why would you want to yeah. cut a rock open? How is it done? Like, what are we learning from that? Yeah, so... Basically, when we get these rocks, all we can see is the manganese crust, which is what you're looking at right now. So we like to cut it open and see what's inside, what the actual rock is composed of mineral-wise, because that's what we use to determine like different information about the rocks. So like Val will want to get a chemical analysis. So ba basically, we'll take the rock. We'll saw it into, it has to be around 50 grams, and it looks like a puck. And that's what we use to like ship out to get the chemical analysis. And then for ages, what we would do is we would make a, well, what I did, because I'm really bad at like guessing sizes, I would take a thin section, just like a blank one, and I would trace it in the rock of like what area I wanted to see under the microscope. So, of course, when I was starting, I had no idea really which area to put the thin section in. But after doing it now and looking at these rocks, me and, me and Val are like, okay, I feel like a thin section would be great in this area where there's not a lot of alteration. And you can get some of these big phenocrysts in the um, microscope so you can see how altered they are. And so that is one of the things that we also do op opening the rocks. And so the reason why these minerals are helpful is because they contain potassium. And potassium is used as it's as the as the dating method, potassium argon, but specifically argon argon dating. So potassium is the parent isotope of the daughter, which is argon. So we'll take these samples that look good in the thin section. We think we can get some ages from them seeing the plagioclase, which contains potassium and ground mass also contains, most of the time contains potassium. So we'll put those all under the mass spectrometer, which is this huge instrument. And it's basically, we shoot the minerals with neutrons, which causes a neutron capture reaction. So that means that the potassium, the, the potassium 39 neutron is absorbed, well, is absorbed and the argon is argon proton is released and so that's the amount of gas that's released gets measured by the mass spectrometer and that determines the ages and so the best thing that we try to do with all these super altered rocks is for sample preparation we would leach them with hcl or hno3 to get rid of some of the alteration and we would also so that's an pick. acid right yes acids leaching with acids and then 
for after the acids, you would go in and you would look at these crystals, which are either plagioclase, amphiboles, clinopyroxene. For my samples, I didn't have any. Well, I did have clinopyroxenes, but I, we preferred amphiboles over the clinopyroxenes. So, because amphiboles are more resistant to alteration and they also form at really high temperatures, which would give us a better age of when exactly these first eruptions started. And so, yeah, so I would look at these under a microscope and I would like hand pick with like, I think I talked about it before, like a little paintbrush, like the tip of a paintbrush, like one, just one strand. And I would pick out the minerals that weren't altered. And so if it was altered, it was really easy to tell because it would have like black spots on it. And so that would hey, be Hannah, useful. sorry to yeah. cut. Can we get a zoom in on those two <laughs> Well, corals? that was pretty much it. The small ones? <laughs> Right, Hannah. right in front of the losers? Yeah, yes. sorry, that's a, that, that okay. was a that lot. Yep. Thank you. We'll push up a little closer. <laughs> All right, go for zoom. Partial. Okay. Looks like there's some type of zoanthids, I think, growing on top of that coral to the left. This looks like a type of hemichorallium, I believe. Looks pretty fragile. And then there's ophiuride. Over here. Yep, that one definitely has some zoanthids on it. Looks like it's nearly dominated. So it's a hemichorallium, like the one to the right, but with the zoanthids. And a small anthomastis in the back. Thank you, guys. Yep. So, Hannah, how thick is the crust on the samples you're looking at? Yeah, so one thing that we noticed is that a lot of them were around one to like two millimeters thick. Okay. Which is, well, originally when we look at that, we're like, oh, this might be a young rock. However, when Val was explaining it, it might be that a rock that wasn't exposed at the time it was formed might have been like hit by a, another rock tumbling down or it could have fallen off like in a fracture zone and then it would have a fresh face and so then it would just start um, having that chemical reaction for the manganese crust to form. So it's not always, it's not always a bad thing or a good thing uh, depending on the manganese crust size but usually if it's pretty thick we know that it's been exposed for a long time. But again, even if it's thin, it's not a bad thing either because it could just have a different um, history of how it ended up there, which is another thing that when we're collecting these rocks, we usually don't see where exactly it came from. We're just picking up debris. So that's one thing that we always have to distinguish in our uh, classification when we describe these rocks is that we just picked them off off of the seafloor, not Beanstalk. specifically like taking it from part of the formation. Right. So that's that's one thing that we have to keep in mind about the manganese crust. But I can't really, sometimes I can't really tell or at least I haven't been able to tell yet if just by looking at a rock without cutting it open how thick the manganese crust is. It, because it usually goes with the, the shape of the rock if it's really thin. But I don't, I, I haven't gotten to that. Yeah. It seems to be pretty thin, like the uh, the one that you showed me yesterday. It was super like, thin. Like you couldn't see really see it in cross section. It was just like huh. a coating. Yeah, because also that one that I showed you, we believe another team, because I know we, we did not collect it, but they believe that they took it from a dike. 
So oh, it yeah. would make sense why it was as thin as it was, but also it was so altered that we were like, it must be older than we, what we think it is because huh. the whole matrix was like a yellowish color. Yeah. But I still believe that the, the horn, no, well, the amphibols that we saw in there are still, they would probably be still useful because they, they're so resilient to alteration. So I still, we still like want, want to make subsamples of that. We just don't know how to cut this rock because it's massive. <laughs> So we don't. Oh, that was the big one that they. Yes, that did. was the the oh, okay. big one. So. Oh, so that was just like a piece that you. Got that was off the it. only piece that we could like get off, <laughs> and of course it had like, fan like amphibols in it, which are fantastic. <laughs> so we're like, the Val's like, I'm gonna have to think about how to cut this this one more. You could smash it with a hammer. You could put hurt down on it and break it. <laughs> I yeah, I was like, I don't know, I don't know what to. Because the saw is so, or at least, I, w I don't know if she even knows how, or how we can, like, if we could make the saw, like, go up higher. I don't, I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Another Holothorian. I've seen a couple of those so far. But also, I'm going to shout out to my dad. He's watching right now. And it was so funny because he heard me say plagioclase, and he sent it to me, and it was spelled really funny and that, that made me laugh dad thank you that was so funny i don't know how any of the co-workers of your parents make it past their offices without being called in <laughs> to listen to you uh, give these explanations i know come here, come here come here she's talking right now i feel like it's i'm almost like a podcast to them but also <laughs> they usually never um well, they say that they don't ever, like, uh, not pay attention during their shift, but my dad has constantly told me that sometimes he watches Netflix while working, and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> he works at, like, in his office with, like, a closed door, so he closes the door and just has it on, because he has, like, multiple screens, so he'll have it on another screen. <laughs> oh, and my mom's watching. Hi, Mom. Love you. Wait, my dad said he accidentally had somebody from work listening to me out him. <laughs> my, uh, our daughter will do that, though. She'll actually have, like, a movie on or something. Like, she doesn't watch it. Just needs that other input while she's working. And mm. I can't do that just because believe this is a bamboo with a another anemone on top of it. Yeah, concurrent on the bamboo from the base. Is it normal for anemones to do that? Um, based on my observations lately, yes. Okay. Um, is, I, appear, I assume it's the same as a lot of these other associates where they are trying to get to a higher place in the water column. How about that dark crinoid on the top? Yeah, there's a very dark purple crinoid as well, I was about to point that out. There's also a white galatheid right there yep. in the be in between them. A lot of these are uh, much higher up in the water column than what we've been seeing on other dives. Getting to an area that's probably going to be flatter than a lot of what we're going to see during the watch. So this, this might be a good place to look for a rock sample, Hannah, if you, yeah. if you think so. Sure. Um, I'm looking, well. These all look pretty big, huh? Yeah. I mean, Derek, if you want to slower stop the ship i'm sure yeah. we can find something the right I'll, size yeah, yeah. I'll stop here yeah bridge nav oh can we do an all stop please um, maybe over here thank you i can't there's also this one right here too that's huge oh, okay so not that one <laughs> What about under the lasers right now? Oh, it has that associated. Yeah, something like that, maybe. 
my pen dropped. There's also some over here, too, but yeah, like maybe that th one. This one. Oh. Yeah, if it's not attached. Yeah, it could be, yeah. Because, um, yeah, there's, there's some. Let's just hope it's not attached. We could take either one of these, too. Yeah. Ooh. That's not attached. <laughs> well, sure. <clears throat> Circle some ones you want me to poke on the top right, uh, I think. Oh. These two, I think? Yes. Those oh, two. Okay. I was telling Matt uh, yesterday that I've been taking a lot of these still captures. He goes, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> if we collect these, they'll go in the starboard box. Stand by. Yeah, we do. We can't put them in the starboard box. We have A, B, C, D, and F open. Okay. Ideally, if it's a smaller rock, go into the prior yeah. four. Yeah. Seat. Hey. Yay. Not attached. You're coming home with me. <laughs> Puhaku. 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 <laughs> it took Malia a second to realize what you were saying. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> It's funny, in a prior life, one of the projects I worked on was building a new studio for one of the home shopping entities. And every time we do this wrist rotate, it reminds me of that. Yeah. Perfect. Good. Perfect. Yes. Thank right. you. Order <laughs> up. We haven't met a rock that Hannah doesn't like yet. Yeah. Except for the ones. Well, I don't hold anything against them. <laughs> that didn't want to come with us. It's fine. <laughs> They can stay home. They don't have to come home with me. I was really excited when I, because I was like, oh, where do all these rocks go? And they, they're like, the Rhode Island, da, da, da. And I was like, can we ever like just go visit and like look at all the rocks in there? And she's like, no, you need to have like high access for that. And I was like. No, you can go. Really? Yeah. Who said that? I think I visited when I was at URI. I used to go there all the time. Oh my god. I mean, you need well, to, in the summer it's nice and cold in there. Yeah, you'll need to make like an appointment because someone needs to be oh, there okay, to let yeah, you yeah. in. And, I think like, she was trying to explain so it you, like that. Yeah, I mean, you need, but it's not, I mean, like, it's it's accessible to, I mean, it's it's a it's a state-funded uh, laboratory. Like, it's accessible to anyone who wants to go. I mean, Is that see within reason, like, seat. I mean, you know, you need to. Charlie. You know, you uh, um, sample number 71, which box was that? C. Charlie. C. Perfect. Thank you. I mean, as a, as a geology grad student, you have credentials enough to, to go there. I mean, if you want to just go say hi to your samples, they might frown on that. No, yeah. But I just wanted to go look at all, like everything. <laughs> and just no, like, I think yeah, just you'd look be at able them all. To. But you're going to have, like, your thin section's already done, right? Um, 
Some of them. Like from the, the, the sections you're cutting off. But yeah. then, then the big parts are going to the lab, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's not how it was with my samples, though. I didn't have thin sections already made. I oh. had to... Well, I meant, like, you're cutting the coupons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, I, that's done somewhere else. If I had that, that would probably made my processing sample preparation faster. But I'm glad that at least I understood where it was coming from, I guess, at the time. But if I were to just like do this again, it would it would have been nice to have it already done. I think one of my favorite parts about uh, igneous geology, and I probably forget the term about this, but is um, like how the the melt fractionates when crystals start crystallizing out. So like if it if it like cools really fast, it'll just crystallize as one. But if like it cools slowly and like Cer time. Certain crystals form first. It changes the composition of the melt so that the crystals that form later are different than it would be if they all form together. Yeah. Um, I think that's really cool, and it and you can like so like the the speed of of how the melt cools tells you can be different minerals depending on how because it's removing certain el uh, elements from the solution as certain minerals form. I think that's my favorite part of igneous geology. Yeah. Even that's, though I don't remember much of it. That's really good though, yeah. Because for these intrusive rocks, you have time and sometimes they have enough space to make those crystals. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's awesome. I read all about that in grad school. So really Love quick it. shout out to um, Mrs. Hammond. Your uh, science class really appreciates you. They want to say happy birthday, haoli lahanao, to Mrs. Hammond. Oh, well, that's great. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. We have not had a birthday on board this lake. Oh, yeah. That's unusual. I had my yep. birthday in July on, uh, actually, I wasn't quite, I wasn't on board a ship yet. I was in a quarantine house uh, before we got on the ship. Mm. Um, Tito, you can bring your heading around to 330. So that was, uh, we didn't do much, I'll say. You can bring your heading around to 330. We made steaks and had wine, and that was about it. Right. Changing bears. When was your birthday? What? When? Uh, Mid July. Mine was mid-August, and I actually had a birthday at home for the... <laughs> does yeah. not happen often. Yeah, I've, I've spent many a birthday on Nautilus. Yeah, in, uh, in 2019, when we were in American Samoa, uh, my birthday came around. Do you folks do anything special for the birthday people on board? Yeah. We, uh, we have a uh, giant uh, uh, creative <laughs> cake. <laughs> Very creative. Uh... Is it uh, edible? <laughs> Usually. Yeah. <laughs> Just a, a little different than what you would normally find. It's it's funny. It goes. It's like it doesn't really matter. Like the chefs turn over, but the cakes are always, like it's it's everything that they can possibly find in the kitchen to put on it. Oh, that's yeah. fun. And it's it's funny because that like kiwi these, carrot. Yeah. <laughs> carrot. Oh my god. <laughs> you name it. Yeah, I remember mine had like all sorts of M and M's and other things all over it. Yeah, Skittles. Uh, <laughs> Skittles. Yeah, it's, it's but it's it's funny because I, it mu must be a cultural thing because the um, the cooks are different you know, uh, often, but it's the same type of cakes come out. Yeah, well, they uh, kitchen sink. Yeah, there's been a cook from the same country for yeah. a long time. So. Yeah, I think uh, different yeah, that's cooks. Really funny. That's um, great. Well, and I think that they they have fun doing it too. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I don't think I don't remember who's the the Samoa one or not, but one of my birthdays, like the cook was practically like vibrating when they brought the the cake yeah. out because he was so excited about it. Oh, that's uh, sweet. And now we're sensitive and we're uh, use a paper plate to put the candles out. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> changed. We don't want a COVID cake. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I had, that had not even occurred to me. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, trying to blow out candles with masks on would be uh, ineffective. Right. <laughs> I think I have a 
photo of one of mine. You can one that looked like a Carmen Miranda hat. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, they definitely put a lot of work into it, though. Much appreciated. Just that and so looking at this I can tell there's a uh, strawberry pineapple uh, rutabaga no I'm just kidding uh, <laughs> carrots pretty funny uh, yeah I've, I've uh, found a carrot inside somebody's birthday cake once <laughs> oh my gosh like that's not, a, that's not sliced a, carrot yeah like a chunk like they were trying to escape from prison carrot <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, that's a different uh, definition of carrot cake, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, I wonder if we have any coming up in the next week or two. I don't know. You, you uh, can't really hide it because they have all of our passports. Oh, my God. Yeah, that that's like true. That's I believe other Jake's birthday is in September. Oh, cool. Don't know when, though. He won't tell me. Yeah. Uh, well, that's okay. The captain knows. And Megan and Daniel know. Because they have lists of passports. That's how I would always do it. I would just, I'd just scroll through and be like, aha. I told him, I was like, you can't hide it. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to happen. You can't you can't lie about this. No, I, I'm the same way. I would, I would totally not tell anybody if I could avoid it. Do you think those are nodules? Too small. Uh, yeah. Really? I think too small too. Oh. oh. She, she said yeah, but was agreeing with oh. you, not with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These just look like rock bag fragments, like really small. <clears throat> rock frag. Yeah. Couldn't these be baby nodules? Yeah, but we wouldn't be, if they were like bait, like they are baby, we, we would need more because we want to see the growth patterns. And I feel like this, these, some of these rocks would just be like one or maybe like two. I don't know though. This is just me guessing. And also it's not a lot of like the shape that we want. So do the manganese only grow on other rocks or could they grow in sediments? They... Well, if you think about the one of the rocks that we were looking at, the hyaloclastites, which was like a mixture between sedimentary and igneous, it was still able to grow on that. But what I found interesting when that's one for you. Um, Sebastian... Ooh, that's a bright purple one. Oh, yeah. Sebastian, I think, Mike, you said so too, about um, they cover like whale, like bones. Yeah. And I was so like fascinated by that because I was like, a, a bone is going to be a different composition than these rocks. Quick so yeah, I just I kind I was trying to figure out what chemical reaction was going on with like the like calcium, probably car carbonates, like bones and stuff, versus these rocks. So that I'm still trying to understand. Mm. I think it'll form on anything that's Coming out. stable. And sediments just shift around. Uh, but yeah, whale bones, rock. Um, but I think it just kind of forms on anything that's there. Um, like some kind of longer surface, though? Because, I mean, otherwise they'd form on, like, corals and stuff, right? I mean, they need, like, a larger surface to form? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I don't think they need a larger surface to form because it's a long time though, right? Yeah, they take a. Can a we get a zoom in on that sponge, please? Yeah, I mean corals move. Okay. You know, like the polyps come in and out. Um, mucus, <laughs> always shedding mucus. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that may be a defense mechanism against that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's stuff that's just that just stays in one place for a very long time that gets uh, the encrustation. And it, so there's two different types, kind of. Not that they're different types, but so it can cover like a, a area of rock like this, but it can also form a nodule around like a shark tooth or a pebble or you know something else, and kind of like a, how a pearl develops. 
It, it just more and more mm. manganese builds up on it over time. And those are the nodules. These are just manganese coatings on, on rocks. Zoom. So they're the same process, but they just form differently on different things. Mahalo for that uh, explanation. That's uh, coming out a little bit. Partial, partial. Whole organism. This looks like. Okay, it looks like Ooh. it may have had a bite taken out of it. In the top left there? Yeah. Interesting. I think this is a bowl so much it's got a bite out of it, or a big piece is kind of knocked off. And what would take a bite out of a sponge? What what it would, what organism? It's like one of those drop stones. Th that's over there. a good question. Um, I'm wondering if it's more of less of a bite and more of something just knocking into it. But there are some animals that eat sponges, but nothing super large that I know of. Go ahead. Oh, is that any? Also, is that rock of any significance to you, Hannah? You're you're muted. You're not on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was kind of wondering too. I can't tell if it's a dead sponge or might be yeah. pumice again. Can we zoom on that? Yep. Go zoom. I think it's a dead oh, sponge. Oh, it's definitely a dead sponge. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yep. Oh. I feel like when one of these rocks like fall from a, may have fallen from a higher place, that they all just settle on the flat ground. Mm. Or at least yeah. this looks like flat ground. Yeah, relatively. We're coming up to another slope though. Headed up to waypoint four. Can we get a zoom in on this red coral right here? Yep. I've been seeing a couple of them. I haven't been able to get a positive ID. Pretty sure it's hemichorallium, just a darker one, but I want to make sure. Do we zoom? Zoom as they go. Tori is back. Yes, for oh. like nine minutes, because I have another one at five. Uh, okay. <laughs> I wanted to come check might out what's going on. Yeah. No, it be a hemichorallium. Oh, it looks a little I bit flexible. Like. You said it might be. Um, uh, Asako, do you happen to know what this is? It's a paragorgia. Okay. Thank you, Steve. All right, we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So there's like, when you see where the coral's attached, there's like some kind of like secretion that, what is that? Is that like carbonate or what is it that they're using to hold themselves in place? Um, I think it's usually kind of a carbonate um, uh, secretion sticky mix, but I think it hardens over time. I know it's very hard by the end, so I think it's primarily calcium carbonate. Mm. Oh, and then a uh, sudden large brazingid. Is that the brittle star? Oh, no, this is a brazingid. It's just a regular starfish. Oh. But it's a filter feeding starfish. 
Okay. You see, those are the ones that when I was watching with Ashana, and I was like, oh my gosh, that almost look, that looks like a cr like I would have said a crinoid. Yeah, I would have as well. She's like, yeah, they're kind of similar, but it's um, a brisket. And that's a sea pen. Yeah. Yeah, looks like it. Every time he says <laughs> brisket, though, I think he's saying bazinga. And Steve yeah. elaborated on um, your question, Malia. Um, he says it's mostly calcium carbonate, calcium carbonates, depending on the type of coral. So for aqua corals, they use a different variation called calcite. And scleroticinians, which are the ones you t typically see in shallow water reefs, use aragonite. Awesome. Mahalo, Steve. That's, it, it's kind of interesting that they can do that, because aragonite and calcite are basically the same composition, but it's a different um, crystal structure. Calcite's uh, blocky and uh, aragonite is more angular. So that's, uh, it's interesting that they can uh, differentiate between those. What makes them choose? I don't know. Usually it's just preference it's a, and for ha oh, habitat and just like yeah. natural selection. They just happen to use it more. Or it might be just be more suitable for certain substrates. Okay. We've got some students in the chat asking for a birthday shout out. To oh, their we did. We did. You did? <laughs> oh, okay. We did. Well, happy birthday, Miss Hammond. That's so sweet. <laughs> I think you have to say happy belated birthday. Happy belated birthday. Mm -hmm. And they think <laughs> highly bad. of her. That's yes, good. from what they've hear. been writing. I know. Sorry, I've been trying to just catch up with no, everything. <laughs> Teachers are important, so. Yeah, you asked, um, or someone said something about like what you, who your favorite teacher was. And I, it's a really hard question to answer because I had some really great teachers in uh, middle school and high school, but my brothers and I were homeschooled through, um, through elementary school. So like, I kind of have to say that was my best teacher, right? Um, but no, there's certainly a lot of a lot of great teachers out there, and and um, they can make a huge impact on on a student. You know, you can get like the one teacher that can turn someone around, um, who's who just if, if someone did really dislikes school, not doing well, or not paying attention, one teacher with a certain amount of attention can really turn that around. Oh, I had a teacher like that, Mr. Machado, Kailua Intermediate, eighth grade the most amazing Hawaiian man, um, oh. Hawaiian culture class. Like he was just, first time ever I had a Hawaiian culture class in Hawaii, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> if you can believe that. Yeah, so just amazing man, Mr. Machado. Oh, I love that. I know we, we were sharing last week, I was talking about a teacher I had in middle school and I've been trying to like find him. <laughs> so I yeah. can like tell him about this experience, but um, I still have not found him, oh, but wow. I messaged some people I went to middle school with, and I'm like, can you please help me? But, oh, I figured oh. out that the middle school closed, and they oh. opened up a new one. So that's oh. why, like, I was looking at the staff directory, and I was like, where is everything? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not even the same place that you went? Yes. That makes sense. So. Um, yeah, do you know people, like, who are in that town still? Yeah. Yeah, because they, they, they would probably know better than, yeah. But well, yeah. yeah, hopefully that works out. But yeah, one thing that I'll share is like last year after I found out that, you know, I got the science communication fellowship, like the students I had, I was so excited to share it with them and I had to leave them for a little bit to go to Rhode Island for our forum and like the shift to shores that we did with those classes, those were so special for me because like I had students that had never like raised their hand in class or participated in class that as soon as we were on that ship to shore, they had like so many questions mm. and like their curiosity just like took over and that was something for me to just sit there and be like I have not seen you like so excited before to like ask this question um and so like that was really special and I just got off a ship to shore with like one of my best friends we went to college together and went through like our teacher prep program together so like we got to talk and I got to meet her students and that was really special so shout out to Miss Gosi's class if y'all awesome. are still listening yeah y'all had great questions I think you might be muted him. <laughs> so that was literally so cute and like so fun. Her name is also Hannah. 
I like her already. <laughs> <laughs> Both have awesome names. <laughs> it's a, um, what is it, the one type of word you can spell forward and backwards? Uh, palindrome? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's one cool, cool thing about my name. You gotta love our teachers, you know? We just gotta put a shout out there for all of our teachers that are investing. I mean, literally, they don't get paid much. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> and so they, they really are investing in the future. And so you gotta love our teachers who have the passion and um, go the extra mile. You know, oftentimes using their own money to buy supplies and, you know, they're, they're putting in extra hours. So I am just sending out a big shout out and big mahalo nui to all of our teachers out there. If you're listening, you are appreciated. Oh, That's I love awesome. That, I think I would enjoy teaching, but likely only at a school for orphans. Why is that? Oh, interesting. No parents. <laughs> right. Okay, I'm about to hop off again. Great conversation. All right, I'll good be luck. back in like 30 minutes. Have fun. I had a colleague uh, who worked in television broadcast for 30, 40 years, retired, became a school bus driver, and uh, unfortunately he passed a couple years ago, but uh, he said that uh, if he could do it all over again, he would have started off as a school bus driver. He loved doing that. Oh, that's cool. And there's a tremendous demand for yeah, people to do that. So. Yeah, okay. I, I think that the picking up of the kids would be fun each day, but I, I would not want to drive physically drive a school bus. It's way too big. Can we get a zoom on that, please? Sorry, the I The lighter in. colored rock? Yes. The pumice tempting thing. <laughs> um, fun. You're, it's also a split shift, right? It's what? You work in the morning, then you have time off, oh, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. you work in the afternoon. Sorry, yeah. We went, we went back to that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Lots of retired people seem to be bus drivers. Yeah. I think it's Thomas. Go for Zoom. Go on in. Oh, look at all the vesicles. Yeah. Is that like the hyaloplastide? You know when we saw the other day in the other yeah. dive? It kind of had that kind of yellowish. A little more. Oh. No, Better. it's not that. But this is... Um, like ash from a volcano, probably terrestrial, or if I don't think I don't know if this seamount was ever exposed to the surface, and if so, I I believe it just like came from currents and it got waterlogged and it sank down. What, what time? You're making noise with your as you're scratching your. Oh, oh, like this? Yeah. <laughs> so it is a pumice? Yeah, I think it's a pumice. Is that worth collecting? No. Okay, just Because I asked Val about that, and she yeah. was like, yeah, we, we don't need it. Because she's like, when you open it, it's just water. Yeah, it's also, it's not from here, because it floated somewhere yeah. and then sank yeah. eventually. So, yeah, okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure, because, yeah, I was looking at the other other one and when we were like oh is it a sponge dead sponge or is it a pumice and I yeah, just yeah yeah this was a pumice yeah that was a dead sponge yeah so is waterlogged pumice like the weight can you tell by lifting it that it's not as heavy and dense as basalt mm, if we picked up a waterlogged i'm not sure because i've never held a waterlogged mm. pumice so i don't know how it's in com I think it compares so. it's, to the manganese it's still pretty light i, I would i think i yeah. mean my pumice like if you had a block of pumice, it would feel like, it'd be like lighter than your phone. Yeah, because. Oh yeah, because I, I know there's a lot of like pumice and cinder yeah. on the big island, which is really a good growing medium. Oh yeah. Because it yeah. allows, you know, the water to kind of, to move through it. But also, I'm just wondering like at the bottom of the ocean, if oh. it has like. Sorry, can we take a zoom at what's ever on that branch right there? Yep. Just we're not a frame bottom right.
Oh, that sphere? Yeah. Deep sea balloon. Um, yeah, but I, th I mean, so, w like, rock is still quite a bit denser than, I think, waterlogged pum uh, pumice. But it'd be cool to find, like, uh, compare them. Yeah, pumice is great for, uh, for, like, water filtering. Mm -hmm. Also, it's great for, uh, getting dead skin off of your, <laughs> your heels. Yes, it is. And people yes. used to clean the toilets with pumice. Like, it's a great cleaning, scarring. Mm -hmm. Oh. It's a rosellid sponge growing on this whip. Huh. That's weird. That's weird. Is it? I haven't seen it before. Okay. Um, it's really kind of, just going back to pumice real quick, it's like, I remember the first time, it just, it's amazing how light it is. It just does not look like a rock should be that light. There's a little shrimp swimming backwards. He's so cool. <laughs> he can swim backwards. Well, I think he's trying to swim forwards, but there's current pushing him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, More purple. Bright purple. That's super cool color. It's the same color as the uh, acorn worms. I'm glad you, that they saw one because I'd forgotten the name of them from when I, we were working out California. <laughs> super cool. It's, I'm honestly unsure why dark purple is a very popular thing amongst, amongst yeah those type of invertebrates. It's like it's like that type of purple that seems to glow. Such a cool color. Mm -hmm. It looks like I'm seeing some low bait flow mixed in with these pillow basalts. I'm trying to send this paper to myself. Yeah. I email myself all the time. Like, mm -hmm. I'll just email myself notes of like, oh, you need to do this when you get off watch. <laughs> it's, a, it's better than writing sticky notes. Because then it's there giving me an uh, alert that I have an email. Yeah, and you have to look at it. I have to look at it, yeah. You don't filter yourself? What's that? You don't filter yourself out of your inbox? No, no. <laughs> Though it's weird. One of my e one of my Gmails, um, I can send emails to anyone else, but I can't send to the same address. It never shows up. It uh, it shows up in my sent box, but not in. I don't know. It's weird. It is weird.
you ever question your own tone that you're using with yourself? <laughs> yeah, like, that was rude, Michael. <laughs> you didn't even say hi, you just wrote. <laughs> and say, dear self, sincerely self. I hope this message finds you well. <laughs> Warmest regards. Self. Mm -hmm. No, I just type lists. That could be a good self-care, though. Just send yourself a really nice note. <laughs> 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 You're doing a great job. People love what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Malia, in the Hawaiian class that you mentioned earlier, was there something that you learned that you did not have any idea about? Like, did you not know about at all? Like, it surprised you? Um, not anything that surprised me. It was just his, his uh, my teacher's manner and the way he taught. You know, he was just so embracing. Um, patient, um, kind. So it was just his whole persona of the way he taught, I think. And then it just kind of reinforced the value of Hawaiian culture. So um, I think that was a big thing for me is because I never had like Hawaiian um, cultural classes in school. That wasn't like a important for the Department of Education. But during my time. And so to have somebody like that willing to share his knowledge, his cultural practice, um, you know, with all of us was really amazing. So, yeah, wow. one of the very few um, Hawaiian cultural classes that were offered in the Department of Education. Nowadays, we do have an Office of Hawaiian Education within the Department of Education in Hawaii. So it's come a long way since I was a student. That's awesome to hear. Because even in Louisiana, we have our own, um, yeah, like Louisiana history. Also, Mike, I wanted to update you. So we, it's not a U-boat. It, oh, it's yeah. not a U-boat at the World War II Museum. But they redid a PT-3 something, like a some type of battle ship not battleship but like some type of ship like a patrol boat pt boat yes i was actually looking into it because they're a pt-305 okay yeah and you can go on it in so the lake poncha train you can ride on one of the world war ii ships it's a it, uh, pt boat's like a it only would hold like three or four people it's that's like, crazy uh, and pt-305 is like the name of it not the, uh so that it's a pt boat and like PT-109 was the vessel name of the one that John F. Kennedy was on. So, yeah, Mike, it's like I, the name um, and the number of it. Um, just reading the third book in the trilogy you recommended. Yeah. And uh, in one of the battles, they say a PT boat took a direct hit. It took out, like, uh, a gunner and a radio man and also injured nine crew members. And oh, I was like, maybe how big yeah, is I this PT think, boat? I didn't think there were that many people on PT boats. And these boats. are PT boats that were doing torpedo runs as well. So I thought it only held like three or four people, but I yeah. could be wrong. But I think like the PT-109 did. I think it had like four or five crew total. But maybe there were different variants. that. Yeah. Especially yeah. if they're doing runs on battleships. It yeah. seemed like that was what... Miss Malia, sorry to, I just like had like a, an instant thought because it reminded me of, I don't know why, of the boat. Because when you're talking about Hawaiian culture, I was like, that's kind of similar to, in fifth grade, I had like Louisiana history and culture class. And then it reminded me of the World War II Museum in, in New Orleans. And then it reminded me of what Mike said yesterday about U-boats. And then it reminded me of looking up <laughs> U-boats. I love those connections. Lot, yeah, that was, that was, that was, was collection, yeah, yeah, there was a lot that was um, being put network. together. Yeah, that was where my thought process was going when you were I don't know if it's still there, but in Honolulu, I don't know if it survived the pandemic. There was a place called the Bruseum. 
that was a bar with like a World War II Jeep and a bunch of other artifacts <laughs> in there. Uh, I'm actually looking up PT Bolt right now to yeah. see what that is. This is cool, this rock here. Another good chance to throw stratification in. Yeah. It really looks like a sheet flow. Many a sheet thick flows. Sheet flow on top of another thick sheet flow. Or they could be just a? multiple thin. I think it's multiple thin ones. I think that's where the lamination comes from. Multiple thin ones. That's one big sponge. Whoa. Oh, yeah. yeah. It doesn't seem like it has a lot of flow there. It's almost connecting those two rocks. Oh, that's impressive. Wow. I don't think I've ever seen one shape quite like that. Yeah. That's strange. Can we get a zoom in, please? Yeah. It looks like some kind of plated coral, not coral sponge. Wow, that's gorgeous. That is gorgeous. Kupaya Naha. Kupaya Naha. Go for Zoom. Um, Asako's asking in. for Max Zoom, please. <laughs> Max Zoom, I. There you go. How about Max Focus, too? If yes, only, please. If only our video engineer was named Max, that'd be better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bridge nap. I was just thinking that we have a video in very good. Gorgeous. Where's Chris Kelly when we need him? Asleep. <laughs> Probably. Oh, is he in Port Townsend right now? I That's, believe so. Uh, Eight o'clock. Where's that? It's in Washington. Uh, Olympic oh, Peninsula. Oh. Gotcha. <laughs> Alright, thank you. Not far from me. Do we know what that is? It's definitely a plate glass sponge. Um, if Sanko's not noting that's anything particularly important. Oh, wait, wait, wait. On the right there might be something. Oh, where on the right? The one on the wall. This? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> is this? Oh. Yes. Can we get zoom on that, please? Oh. That does look like that. Miss Malia, do you have the target sheet? Um, do we need to stop the ship or anything? Yes, please. Yes, there you go. Okay, thanks. I don't. Next one step ahead. It's very, very similar. I'll come show you when I'm it's done. Okay. Oh, let's sell up. Um, give me one sec to make a quick Google. Yeah, no worries. Okay, um, the big guy, Steve, has an uneducated guess that's an Atalatacella, but this guy in front of us, Ooh. I think, is would it be looks like a, a Tetroplura, or a Tretoplura. Okay, awesome, thank you. Tretoplura. Um, so I'm looking at it. I'm lightly against it being the target species, purely because the target species has these holes along the edges. Yeah. Um, so we're I think we're gonna leave this guy. Thank mm -hmm. you. Look at the uh, the Argus view. You see the oh my the God. blocks there. Yeah. That's really cool. Can we get a capture of the Argus view? Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Sebastian. So Sebastian, the um, the one that we're looking at, it kind of has like a blue tinge on it, yeah? A little bit, but I think that's actually mostly due to the water behind it. Oh. It's, both, it's partially transparent, giving it a slight blue color. Kind of looks like uh, marine algae, like limo. Is that yeah, look, well, look, oh, all right, so what I was saying with that sponge of the current, this way there is a lot of current, and the sponge is probably trapping everything moving through yeah. there, but yeah, there's so much movement that we have sand ripples in there. Yeah, and the edges of these sheets, I think, look a little bit polished from the current. Yeah. 
That's cool. That just gives you an idea of how strong these currents are that they can polish these manganese cups. Yeah. This is a strange little like rock field. Like it's not like it's very broken up. Yeah. I've noticed <laughs> while looking at uh well writing it down, the observations, I'm like, this is a lot of change really fast. Yeah. It looks like it was all very thin sheets that like deposited here. And then like a lot of it looks like faulted and bro and cracked and broken. Oh, no, that's where what Argus was just looking at. This here. Do you want me to move that's forward cool. again? Wow. It's almost like a like um. a paved road. Yeah. Let me just get out in front. Sure. Like a little wall. Yeah, it's a pretty neat view out of Atalanta. Yeah. Overview. No, that looks super awesome. I agree. You can see her just creeping into the bottom of the frame. Yeah. <laughs> that could be a highlight, man. Thing in snapshots. Good, thanks. Right. It's kind of like um, when you watch the Lord of the Rings movies, like as they're journeying, the landscape changes, they go to different... It's like it's like as we go up this slope, like we, Bridge, we get yeah. to different sort of rock formations as we go. Can we track a line bearing 330 at 0.2, please? Thank you. One time I had a dream that I was looking at geology where Lord of the Rings was <laughs> filmed. One New Zealand. Time. Yeah, New Zealand. I was in New Zealand specifically for Lord of the It was when I was re-watching them. That's cool. That was I would, so funny. I would love to go there. Me too. I went there for my honeymoon and we went to this bar and it was like one of the places where the cast had hung out. Wow. Oh yeah, wow. that's awesome. They were filming nearby. It's amazing that so much time, it's been 20 years, or long, like 22 years since those movies that have come out. That is amazing. It's like, yeah. Best I have a movies friend ever. From, yeah, oh, you're, you're awesome. so good. One of my friends from uh, college ended up marrying a sheep rancher like half an hour from where they filmed the Shire part. Oh yeah. Wow. So it's like that rolling green hills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have a ranch that's just like that. Oh, wow. I always refer to like where I live as kind of like the Shire because it's like the rolling hills of New Hampshire. It's not open like that, but it's just kind of like mild terrain. <laughs> yeah, New England can get can, can look like that for sure. Yeah. Yeah, when we make these, when we make do these dives climbing these mountains, I often try to visualize what it would look like if you were hiking up this. Yeah. Like, yeah. You'd see so much more ge of the the fine topography than we're able to visualize, but you get a little glimpse here, the ROVs. Yeah, I mean, you'd you'd actually see kind of a a mix of the Argus and Hercules, like you'd see. You wouldn't see as close up as Herc is, but you wouldn't see like aerial, but you kind of see like yeah somewhere in between those. Man, look at these lines that run through. It's so cool.